Welcome back to Harbour Unbox for part three of the Ryzen 3 Gaming Benchmark series. Unfortunately, this probably will be the last video in this series, at least for now, as I will be shifting focus back to RX Vega after this. And then hopefully we will have Intel's eighth generation desktop CPU series as well. So we'll get to do it all over again. Anyway, right now, for your viewing pleasure, I have spent a few days slaving away at the test bed, testing some old bangers. One much loved old banger, and one uh, less loved, let's put it that way. I'll let you work out which one's which in a moment. Contestant number one is Intel's Core i5-2500K. Based on the architecture codenamed Sandy Bridge, this is the second generation core architecture and it was released back in 2012 and to this day it's probably Intel's most impressive development in the last decade. The 2500K came in at $216 US, effectively replacing 2009's Core i5-750. Truth be told, the difference between today's 7th generation Core i5-7600K and the 2500K isn't really that big when matched clock for clock. It's certainly not nearly as big as the 5 year age gap would suggest. Even so, many Core i5-2500K owners have been asking me if it's time to upgrade and does something like the ultra affordable Ryzen 3 1200 present as a suitable upgrade or is it worth just spending a little more on say the R5-1400 or maybe even something a little more extreme. Then we have the, if nothing else, resilient AMD FX owners. Hats off to you guys for sticking it out. Uh, heaps of you have been asking me uh, if, if you have like an FX 4000 or a 6000 or an 8000 series CPU, what are the benefits or what sort of bump in performance can you expect if you were to upgrade to Ryzen 3? That is assuming it is an upgrade at all. So I've taken the FX 8370 and I've overclocked it to 4.4 GHz to try and find out. Please note the Core i5-2500K has also been overclocked to the same 4.4 GHz, and this is probably considered to be more of a mild overclock for these parts, uh, especially the Core i5. Now, for this benchmark showdown, Harbour Unboxed has partnered with LastPass. If you guys have passwords, and I'm sure you do, but don't know what LastPass is, well, let me tell you, your life could be made much easier. We all know that you shouldn't reuse the same password on multiple sites for security reasons, but it can be hard to remember so many different passwords, so sometimes it's easy to just get lazy. With LastPass, you don't have to write or remember any passwords. They can generate a unique password for every website, store it securely in the cloud, and autofill it into websites to make your life much easier and so much more secure. The really cool thing about LastPass reaching out to partner up is the fact that I've actually been using this service for many years now, and all the staff over at TechSpot do as well. I found it to be a real lifesaver when having to share passwords among multiple staff members. The last thing you want to do is transmit a password via email or instant messaging, and this is why LastPass allows users to easily and safely share passwords with other LastPass accounts. For more information, please check the link in the video description. Big thanks to LastPass for partnering with us on this. Now, it's time for the benchmarks. Here's a look at the test system specs and a few quick notes on what we're doing here. So once again, we're testing nine games at 1080p using the GeForce GTX 1060, 1070, and 1080. The Core i5, 2500K, and FX8370 have been overclocked to 4.4 gigahertz, while the Ryzen 3 1200 and Ryzen 5 1400 have been clocked at 4 gigahertz. Meanwhile, the locked Pentium G4560 will be operating at its default clock speed of 3.5 gigahertz, as you can't overclock locked CPUs. All right, to the benchmarks. First up, we have Battlefield 1, and let's start with the GeForce GTX 1060 results. Here, every CPU, with the exception of the FX8370, were able to max out the 1060. I found previously the FX series really struggled on Battlefield 1, and here frame drops are a common occurrence. The Core i5-2500K, on the other hand, had no trouble matching the Ryzen CPUs, though neither did the G4560. Moving to the GTX 1070, we see that the Pentium G4560 starts to fall behind, and interestingly, the FX8370 is able to pull ahead now, though the old AMD CPU does still trail the Ryzen and Core i5-2500K CPUs by a noticeable margin. Still, with the 1070, performance doesn't look bad. Using a more powerful GPU in the GTX 1080, we start to see a real weakness in the FX8370, and shockingly, this 8-core, or 4-module CPU, however you want to word it, struggles to beat the dual-core Pentium G4560. Meanwhile, on average, the 2500K delivered 28% more frames with the GTX 1080. 
The 2500K even edged out the R3 1200, providing a few extra frames and wasn't much slower than the R5 1400. This here is exactly why so many have so much love for the 2500K and of course even its bigger brother, the 2600K. Next up we have F1 2016 and some more interesting results to go over here. So again, even with the GTX 1060 installed, the FX8370 struggles to extract the maximum performance and falls a few frames behind the pack. It's not really a big deal, that is until you install something with a bit more oomph. Something like the GTX 1070 for example. Here the FX8370 hits the same 55 FPS minimum as the Pentium G4560, though the average frame rate was 14% lower. Now you might think with a tighter margin between the minimum and average frame rates that the FX8370 provided a smoother experience, but no, I can let you know that wasn't the case. Meanwhile, the Core i5-2500K matched the Ryzen 3 1200 and the Ryzen 5 1400 in what was a very impressive display, spitting out 94 FPS on average. The 2500K wasn't done yet either. Onto the GTX 1080, and we see that the 2500K actually pulls ahead of the Ryzen CPUs with a minimum frame rate of 87 FPS. So if you have an overclocked 2500K and you play F1 2016, I'd probably hold off on upgrading to a current generation sub $200 CPU. Far Cry Primal is a heavily GPU bound game and even so the FX8370 still manages to stand out like a sore thumb. Intel always seems to have a bit of an advantage in this title so it's probably not hugely surprising that Pentium G4560 outclasses the FX8370 every step of the way. The 2500K also gives the Ryzen CPUs a really hard time and with a fairly sensible configuration using something like the GTX 1070, the Ryzen 3 1200 at 4GHz still couldn't keep pace. Total War Warhammer is a destroyer of CPUs, though this time the FX8370 does hang in there pretty well with the G4560. That said, even with the GTX 1060 handling the rendering work, the R3 1200 was 20% faster than the FX chip, so a big upgrade there. That said, we've seen multiple times out the Core i5-2500K hangs in there really well. In fact, once we increase the GPU power with the GTX 1070, the 2500K is now seen matching the Ryzen 5 1400, making it a little bit faster than the R3 1200. Meanwhile, the FX8370 is still stuck averaging around 60 FPS along with the G4560. We're pretty much CPU bound even with the GTX 1070, so upgrading is something more powerful like the GTX 1080 really offers nothing extra here. For playing the popular Overwatch first person shooter, we find those rocking a GTX 1060 or slower will be served very well by any of these CPUs, all pushed well over 100 FPS at all times. Moving to the GTX 1070 shook things up a little, though interestingly the FX8370 still manages to stick with the Ryzen 3 1200 and turns in a very impressive 185 FPS average. The 2500K was faster again though, not by much this time. Meanwhile, the Ryzen 5 1400 was able to boost the minimum frame rate by 12% over the 2500K. Then with the GeForce GTX 10A, we find what looks to be the limits of the FX8370. The minimum frame rate was increased quite a bit though, the average frame rate was much the same. This means when using more powerful GPUs, the Ryzen 3 CPU will offer a little more headroom in this title. The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt is mostly a GPU bound game in our testing, even at 1080p. Please note though, I am using the maximum in-game quality settings, which does include hair works. Using the GTX 1060, we see much the same performance on all five CPUs. It was also a similar story with the GTX 1070, though the G4560's minimum frame rate does slip behind here. Then with the GTX 1080 installed, the Ryzen CPUs along with the 2500K are able to get the most out of this high-end GPU. Next up we have Rainbow Six Siege and here we have some very competitive performance using the GeForce GTX 1060. Performance is much the same though the Ryzen 3 and Ryzen 5 CPUs do deliver the best minimum frame rates. Even with the GeForce GTX 1070, performance remains quite similar across the five CPUs tested. We do see some variants here and the Pentium G4560 and FX8370 are starting to lag behind. Meanwhile the 2500K matched the R5 1400's average frame rate but did dip slightly lower for the minimum. Moving to the GTX 1080, we saw further performance gains with all five processors, though the G4560 didn't really have much more to give. She's really given it all she's got, Captain. Uh, I'll see myself out. <laughs> Actually, there are a few more things I would like to note here before commencing the walk of shame. 
You might have noticed, although the FX 8370 is now averaging 154 FPS, we still saw frame dips down to 118 FPS, and that made the FX CPU much slower than the 2500K and Ryzen CPUs. World of Tanks, it really isn't that demanding on the CPU or the GPU. That said, the FX8370 makes it look like a real chore, even with the GTX 1060. I realize that we've seen some pretty poor performances from the FX series, but I was really surprised by how average it does here. Granted, we are pushing over 100 FPS at all times, but when compared to the competition, it really does just putt along. We see that the FX8370 finds its limits with the GTX 1060, and that's, that is really all she's got on this one. Uh, we find the same performance with the GTX 1070 and GTX 1080. Meanwhile, the G4560 does max out with the GTX 1070, and it's really much the same situation with the Ryzen and Core i5 CPUs. World of Tanks favors single thread performance, or at least frequency, and this hands the Core i5-2500K a slight performance advantage in this title. Wrapping up the benchmarks, we have Counter-Strike Global Offensive, and like World of Tanks, strong single-thread performance really counts for a lot here. As a result, the Core i5-2500K looks really strong. Of course, it does only match the minimum frame rate of the Ryzen 3 and Ryzen 5 CPUs. It does seem a bit odd saying only, but that's because the average is at least 8% higher with the GTX 1070 and 1080. All right, so we've checked out how these CPUs compare in nine strategically selected games using a range of different tiered graphics cards. The point of this comparison was to see what kind of upgrade Ryzen 3 might provide those still gaming with a much older AMD FX or Intel Core i5-2500K processor. I am generalizing with the FX 8370 here as it is the flagship model and it really will cover all the lower tiered FX processors as well. So let's start with the FX8370 results. And again, this information really applies for anyone using the AM3 platform in general. Uh, they all are unlocked parts and the FX8370 is really the flagship model excluding the uh, 8000 series, but they're just super power hungry and not many people bought them. So yeah, uh, it'll really cover anyone using that platform. So in my opinion, the Ryzen 3, it will offer a solid upgrade for pretty much any FX series uh, owner. Of course, how much of an upgrade, it will really depend on two things, the games you play and what kind of graphics card you're using. With a graphics card that's equivalent to say the GeForce GTX 1060, or of course slower, for most games the gains will be quite slim. That said, if you play titles such as Counter-Strike Global Offensive, Total War Warhammer, or even World of Tanks, then you will see a noteworthy gain with the GTX 1060. The gains will be even greater for those using an FX 6000 or 4000 series CPU. As the GPU power increases, there's a good chance Ryzen 3 will make noticeable performance improvements. So if you plan to get yourself a GTX 1070 or maybe a custom board partner Vega 56 card in a few months time, then I highly recommend switching to Ryzen 3. Of course, the good news here with this upgrade option is that you can still increase the CPU power quite substantially down the track by getting a 6-core, even an 8-core Ryzen CPU for a reasonable price, or you could quite possibly even get a second-generation Ryzen CPU, of course, once they're released. So, in short, if I was still suffering with an AMD FX series CPU, I'd be jumping on the Ryzen bandwagon faster than you could call me a fanboy. As for the Core i5-2500K, well, that CPU simply refuses to die. It's the little engine that could, and by the looks of it, always will. If you're a 2500K owner still holding out for a cost-effective upgrade, well, keep waiting. Unless you're jumping to a modern Core i7 or maybe the Ryzen 5 1600, the gains simply aren't there to justify the upgrade. There really were very few instances where the 2500K trailed the Ryzen CPUs, and when it did, the margins, they really were very small. Having seen what we've seen here, I'm now really keen to do an in-depth 2500K revisit and compare it to CPUs such as the R5-1600 and i5-7600K. Maybe once I'm done with all this Vega testing, that's something I'll look into. Finally, a few side notes. If you want to see how Ryzen 3 stacks up against higher-end CPUs, please just check the day one review, as I've covered all that there. There's a heap of different CPUs compared to Ryzen 3, so it'll give you an idea of how things stack up. 
Also, for price versus performance data, please check the previous video in this series. I'll throw the link in the video description to both the videos just mentioned. Uh, there wasn't much point doing the price versus performance stuff in this because we're testing five-year-old CPUs that you can no longer purchase new anyway. Also, for power consumption figures, uh, again, please check the Day 1 Ryzen 3 review. All that information's there. That said, though, the data for the 2500K and FX8370 won't be found there. In short, the 2500K is still very fuel efficient, even by today's standards, whereas the FX8370 will eat up polar bear territory faster than you can say global warming. Well, that's going to do it for this one, guys. I hope you've enjoyed this benchmark series. It was a heap of effort, but... I think it was well and truly worth it. I personally really enjoyed seeing how everything stacked up and all the different scenarios we looked at. We've pretty much checked out Ryzen 3's gaming performance from just about every angle possible now, so potential buyers should have a good idea of what they're getting. As always, stay tuned because later this week I have a massive 30 game benchmark video looking at Vega 56, 64 and 64 liquid cooled and they will be compared to custom board partner and founder's edition models of the GTX 1070 and 1080. It's going to be epic. I'm your host Steve. See you again soon guys.